My dear, but there is a principle. That's Galileo Galilei, the father of, well, a lot of things. Hi. Then Nicholas Copernicus, who proposed that the planets revolved around the sun instead of the Earth. Hello. Edmund Halley, who has the famous Halley's Comet named after him. Hello. Stephen Hawking, a world-renowned theoretical physicist with an incredible mind. Hello. And then we have Carl Sagan, the most famous American scientist of the 1980s. Hi. May I present Ptolemy, mathematician, astronomer, geographer, astrologer, and poet. Greetings. Hello. Hello. Wow, that's rather a lot of titles. Well, I have rather a lot of interests. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to know about the blood moon and what it means. Before I start on eclipses, do you remember how Earth orbits around the sun and how our solar system works? A little. I don't. This is our solar system. How many planets are there? Eight. Very good. As you can see, this is where we are, Earth. Third planet from the sun. Correct. To qualify as a planet, one of the requirements is that it must orbit a star. In this case, the sun. Orbit? Orbit simply refers to the path that an object in space takes around another one. What does this have to do with the eclipse? Well, during a total lunar eclipse, the Earth lies directly between the Sun and the Moon, causing the Earth to cast its shadow on the Moon. Now, you would think that the Moon would be thrown into darkness by Earth's shadow. However, Earth has an atmosphere, and the Sun's light that hits Earth bounces off to hit the Moon. But shouldn't the Moon be white? Earth's atmosphere is full of very tiny particles. When sun rays enter the atmosphere, they hit these tiny particles. Look here, you can see light is made up of different wavelengths. Oh, each wavelength has a different color. Yes, exactly. Red wavelengths are scattered less than the rest. Thus, upon reaching the moon, they make the moon red. So, Mr. Ptolemy, do other planets with moons experience lunar eclipses as well? Oh, well, yes! The planets with moons, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, do experience lunar eclipses. Jupiter has 69 moons, but only four are large enough to create a total eclipse. A triple eclipse happens on Jupiter one to two times every decade. Um, uh, Mr. Ptolemy, how do we photograph the eclipse? Aha! Let me get you the guy just for that. Hubble? Hubble? Where are you? Hubble! Down here! Ptolemy, old friend, you're completely blocking my line of sight. Couldn't wait for an introduction? I like to make an entrance. Edwin Hubble, pleased to meet you. Wait, Hubble? Like the telescope? Indeed. Oh, don't get too excited. He didn't invent it, though. Thanks. Thanks for that. It's true, no? It was named after me because I am known as the man who discovered the cosmos. Hmm, arguable. The Hubble telescope is still in operation today. Yes, it's a vital tool for the study of astronomy. It takes extremely high-resolution images, giving us a deep view into space and time. Mr. Hubble, my friends would like to find out the best ways to photograph a blood moon eclipse. Wait, are you saying we need something as powerful as the Hubble telescope to photograph the eclipse? Not at all. With a modern camera, one would need a 500mm to 2000mm lens to take dramatic close-ups of the eclipse. But I only have an 85mm lens. And that's okay, too. People take photos of eclipses with their smartphones all the time. It's absolutely doable. I tried just now to make my own zoom lens. It couldn't attach at all to the camera body or to my phone. You don't have to use a zoom lens. The eclipse is beautiful even from afar. The way it's viewed with the naked eye. What does that mean, Mr. Hubble? That means you shouldn't fret about your 85mm lens. 
You mean you think it'd still look okay? I think it would still look good. I know of somewhere we can go. Someone who actually, currently, lives in space. Lives in space? Um, Bob, are you sure we're in the right place? Positive. But what does fridges have to do with... My, my, someone left the fridge door open. Hello, gentlemen. I have with me here my friends Marie and Argo. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Greetings. Good day. How can we help you? Well, I'm taking part in a science competition and... What topic? Electromagnetism? Ohm's law, yes. Clearly, she's here to understand Ampere's law. I have a law named after me too, you know. The energy in a magnet is measured in units of megagoss or stids. Actually, I'm just here to get as much information as I can about magnets. I was hoping that from there I could get some inspiration. Well, Marie, magnets are actually used in our daily lives. But you just may not know they are magnets. Such such as the way the fridge door opens and closes, those anti theft security tags on clothes, credit cards, all have components of magnetism in them. We are, in fact, living in a magnet. Earth is like one giant magnet. Our planet has a magnetic field called the geomagnetic field. Oh, so that's how a compass works then? They use the geomagnetic field to find directions? Exactly! The north pole of a magnet points towards the Earth's north pole. The Earth's magnetic field is created by the rotation of the Earth and Earth's core. It also shields the Earth against harmful particles in space. That's right, but reversal in the poles can happen. Poles reversal? Where magnetic north becomes south and vice versa. The last one happened 780,000 years ago. Wow. Migratory animals also use this field when they travel long distances each spring and fall. They do? But how do they, um, connect with the field? Well, studies have shown that homing pigeons likely use tiny magnetic particles in their beaks to sense our planet's magnetic field. Homing pigeons? Well, long, long before your time, homing pigeons were used as message carriers. Long before emails existed, homing pigeons are renowned for being able to find their way back home with great precision, even over long distances. Oh, not a fan of pigeons. One flew into my face once and traumatized me to this day. They have no sense of fear. Considering they have a great sense of direction, I'm guessing that was on purpose. Don't you think, Curie? Curie? Um... Curie has kind of been missing for a while. Wow, Curie the scientist, as in husband of Marie Curie? I was named after Marie Curie. That's the one. Oh no, why is he missing? Says here he was checking up on Scrappy, but he hasn't been back for hours. He has a dog? Scrappy is Scrap Monster. His creation is bet in Sekame Scrap Rampage on his website. Hmm, I really want to meet him though. Hmm. Okay, so Pierre Curie is over at his website. How about we head over there, then figure out what to do? Be safe! Good luck. Bring him home! Lovely to have met bon you! Voyage. Is that a volcano? It is. Be prepared. What? Presenting James Hutton the father of modern geology. I bet he knows a lot about rocks. Top of the morning to you. Hello, Mr. Hutton. I'm Marie. And I'm Argo. We have a question about a rock. I love rocks. Hmm, now that's quite a specimen. How would you and you like to help me figure out what it is? Okay. Okay then, the first step in solving the mystery of that... Oh. Uh oh! Ah! Ah! I ah! have a ah! Lava! Ah! It's c coming right towards us!
So, that was Geology Exhibit A. If that was Exhibit A, I sure hope there's no... Exhibit B is Planet Earth. Whoa! The Earth has three layers. This is the crust. This is the mantle. And this is the core. The inner core is solid metal made of nickel and iron. It's so hot that it melts the rocks in the outer core into magma. Is magma the same thing as the lava that came out from the volcano? Aye, and when magma cools and hardens either above the surface or below the surface, it creates igneous rocks like basalt and obsidian. Why don't we first look at another type of rock, metamorphic. Metamorphic rocks are formed out of existing rocks and minerals located here. When the heat of the magma rises up from below and the weight of the rocks pushes down from above, all these rocks and minerals in the middle chemically change from what they were into the new rocks they have become. Some of my favourite metamorphic rocks are marble, quartzite, gneiss and slate. But we've still got one type of rock left that yours might be. When dirt and rocks are eroded by wind and rain, tiny bits of them end up in rivers and lakes. And over many, many years, this sediment is deposited along river or lake beds, eventually hardening into sedimentary rocks, like sandstone and limestone. Cool. So, which one is your mystery rock? Igneous? Anamorphic? Or sedimentary? I still don't think it's any of them. And you, Lassie, would be right. Then what kind of a rock is it? It isn't. Your mystery rock is not a rock at all. It's a fossil. A fossil? Aye, looks like the fossilized egg of a dinosaur. Uh-oh. Looks like another volcano is about to blow. But, but... What about how fossils are formed? I'd love to help you, Lassie, but you'll have to do some digging of your own on that one. Well, I guess we can always come back later. To watch more, subscribe to our YouTube channel.